Hey, good morning. I'd like to also thank the organizers for the opportunity to tell you about some of our recent work on forbidden transitions in ultra-cold Rydberg atoms. And I'd first like to acknowledge all the people that did the work. Uh, these are the students and postdocs past and present at UConn, Dave Tong, Shahid Faruqi, Eric Van Kempen, Rico Perez, and Marco Ascoli, who is here. Uh, Rico has actually recently uh, joined Matthias Weidemuller's group in Heidelberg. Uh, the people in red here are theorists. Uh, these are two of Robin Cote's students, and Robin has certainly helped us out with some of the calculations. I'd like to also acknowledge my collaborator, Ed Eiler, at UConn. And we've also got some help from Andre Derevienko at University of Nevada, Reno, on the second topic I'll talk about. Okay, so brief outline. Uh, first, introduce the topic, tell you a little bit about our experiment, and then the results from two experiments. One looking at electric quadrupole or E2 transitions from the 5S in rubidium to high N Rydberg's, ND Rydberg states. <clears throat> and the second experiment is also electric quadrupole, but also uh, magnetic dipole transition from the 5P in rubidium to the 8P. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so what are some of the motivations? Well, just in general, uh, cold atoms are certainly useful for spectroscopy. The motional effects are greatly reduced. Uh, one can prepare atoms in specific states, which is often very useful. And one can also uh, spatially localize them very well. So, for example, if you want them to experience a uniform Rabi frequency, uh, this is very nice. And for forbidden transitions, in general, uh, it turns out that what got us into this in the first place was uh, these forbidden transitions can mimic stark mixing or atom-atom interactions. And I'll show you an example of that in the first topic that I'll talk about. But uh, the, the selection rules for forbidden transitions also extend the available states if you're doing single photon excitation, for example. And there's usually narrow resonances associated with forbidden transitions. And because of that, uh, states that can decay only by forbidden transitions are, are lo very long-lived or metastable. And <clears throat> in the second example, I'll talk about the uh, forbidden transitions are actually a very sensitive probe of atomic wave functions and atomic structure calculations. So this is very relevant, of course, for things like parity violation experiments. Okay, so the word forbidden often has a negative connotation. Uh, the forbidden fruit. Uh, so on, on the one hand, forbidden things are often very tempting, right? That's the idea of the forbidden fruit. And I, I told my wife we're working on some forbidden transition stuff. She says, well, you better be very careful. You don't want to get caught. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret that. But. Anyway, we, we have done some work in that, and uh, that's what I'd like to, to tell you about. But, you know, I would say we're, we're all grown physicists, so if we want to work on forbidden things, we, we, we can. So. Okay, so what do I mean by forbidden transitions? Uh, basically, I'll just focus on these three types of transitions. The E1, or electric dipole transition, is, of course, the, the common one. The selection rule there is, is delta L equals plus or minus 1. And that's, uh, for example, the resonance line and alkalis are all E1. So 5S to 5P, <coughs> 5S to 5P in rubidium. Electric quadrupole uh, has a selection rule of delta L equals 0 or plus or minus 2. So for example, starting in 5S, you can go to the 4D in rubidium by electric quadrupole. And the magnetic dipole is delta L equals 0. Uh, we call that M1. And if you go between, say, hyperfine levels of the ground state of rubidium, that would be a magnetic dipole. Okay, so just a brief outline of our experimental setup. Uh, we make our cold atoms in a standard MOT, so we have the usual uh, trapping and repumping lasers. And we excite to, at least in the first set of experiments I'll tell you about, we excite to Rydberg states with a single photon, so this is it. 297 nanometers, uh, going to high-lying high P states or D states. So we start with a CW dye laser, 
and pulse amplify that in a couple of amplifier cells pumped by a injection seated YAG laser, which is important to keep the bandwidth essentially transform limited. So at about 100 or 200 megahertz for these few nanosecond pulses. And then we frequency double that to 297 and send that into the MOT. In the second set of experiments, uh, we're not doing pulsed excitation. We're actually using the CW dye laser directly. And I'll, I'll tell you about that later. So once we've created the uh, Rydberg atoms, we have them located between a set of field plates so we can field ionize them and send them to an ion detector. So most of the data I'll show you is, is done by ionization detection. Okay, here's a, uh, a photo of the apparatus opened. Uh, this is the set of field plates. Uh, this is the ion detector. This is actually an old one. We're using a different one now. So you have various windows to send in the MOT beams and, and the other excitation beams. Actually, the excitation beams, <coughs> since it's pulsed in UV, they come in through Brewster windows, which are not shown here. They're on the, the top flange, which uh, would close this chamber up. Okay, so let me go back a few years. And ac actually, this is something that uh, Robin Cote mentioned in his talk yesterday, uh, this idea of molecular resonances. So the idea is that if we're scanning in the vicinity of a, an allowed transition from 5S in rubidium to 70P, a single photon transition, we get a huge peak here. So th this is the spectrum tilted sideways. So this is energy here and signal here. So this is a big off-scale peak corresponding to the 70p atomic resonance. But out in the, in the wings here, we see these, this small feature. And this lines up very well with the 69d plus 70s asymptote. So we think of this main atomic peak as being coincident with the 70p plus 70p molecular asymptote. So two 70p atoms forming a molecule, if you will. And there are attractive potentials. I'm just showing one here. It's a very simplified picture. Coming down and crossing and mixing with other potentials, other uh, asymptotes, I should say. In this case, 69D plus 70S. So this is at an average energy of these two states. So you can't excite it by single photon. So it's really a two-photon process, two-excited atom process, giving rise to this little feature here. So... I guess I, okay, that's not important. So to verify that this was a molecular in nature, we basically showed that it was proportional to the square of the density, that is, it's a, it's a two atom effect, and that it's also proportional to the square of the UV intensity, which is exciting or producing the Rydberg atoms. So it's it's a two photon effect or a two excited atom effect. So this is, uh, this was, this all made sense and, and tied together nicely. Now, this is uh, some other data showing new molecular resonances. So th this is highly saturated. So this is the, the atomic peak, which should be off scale. But uh, this is saturated, so we can focus on these smaller signals. So the little blip I showed you in the last data was this guy, the 69D plus 70S molecular resonance. And as Ruben described yesterday, this is pretty well understood now. But there are some other features like here and here, which line up with uh, these particular asymptotes. But then there's also this guy, 69D. Now I could also write this as 69D plus 69D, because if it's one excited atom, then two excited atoms would fall at the same same photon energy. So the question is, is this a molecular resonance? So we explored that. Uh, but first, let me remind you of, of the various transitions that can happen. So we're starting in the 5S in rubidium, going up to the 30P. This is for lower N. So this is an E1 transition. Now what about the D state? Well, uh, that could go by one photon if you have stark mixing of 30p character into the 29d state. But in zero field, that would not happen. But it is allowed by E2, because delta L is 2, right? You're going from an S to a D state. If you go to the, uh, to the nearby S state, the 31S, that is not allowed by E2. It turns out that going from L equals 0 to L equals 0 is not allowed. Again, if there's some stark mixing, then you could have some E1 amplitude here. So 
the D states that we saw, this is at lower end now. We see, uh, definitely see some D signal. This is a scan over that whole region. So this is the 30P, the, the normal E1 transition. This is at very low intensity, about 20 kilowatts per square centimeter. Sounds big, but remember this is a pulsed experiment. This is at a factor of 1,000 higher intensity. So these transitions are quite weak, roughly a factor of a few thousand smaller in amplitude. And I'm showing here two cases, one with zero field, the black, and one with a, a fairly large field, about two volts per centimeter, as the blue curve. So there's certainly a contribution from the stark mixing, but even in zero field, we see a significant signal there. Notice with no field, uh, we basically see no S signal, which is consistent with this being E2 transitions. Remember, S to S is not allowed, S to D is allowed. So this convinced us that uh, what we're seeing is probably just atomic E2 transitions, not molecular resonances for these particular uh, signals. So we wanted to verify through the density and intensity dependence that these were single atom effects. Let me just remind you how we, how we do that. To vary the atomic density, we don't really vary the atomic density. We vary the density in the relevant state. So these are the two hyperfine levels of rubidium. We excite from the upper one. So if we transfer atoms into the lower one, F equals two, they're effectively not there when we've, we've reduced our density. We do that by simply delaying when we turn off the trap laser. So we turn off the repump laser first, turn off the re, uh, trap laser later. And the trap laser does very slow optical pumping via off-resonant excited states into the lower level. And so this shows, this is a scan from F prime equals three. These are the two fine structure levels for uh, the 43P. And so we see nothing over here because all the atoms are in the F equals three level. But if we delay this turnoff and we optically pump about 50% for a delay time of 60 microseconds into the F equals two level. And so we see signal there. So we, we reduced our effective density on the F equals three by this, by this technique. So if we look at the dependence of signal size on density, now it's linear instead of quadratic. So this verifies this is a single atom effect. And also it's linear in UV intensity. So it's also a, a single excited atom or single photon effect. Okay, now what about the Stark shift? That's, that's obviously important. So this is a, a Stark parabola, meaning we look at the signal size as we vary an applied electric field. And the reason it's a parabola is because the P character that you mix in is linearly proportional to the electric field. And then you square that to get the, uh, the signal size. Now notice this doesn't go to zero at zero field. In fact, it minimizes at a non-zero field, and that's because we have some stray field present in our apparatus, which is on the order of 30 millivolts per, per centimeter. The reason it doesn't go to zero is because we have a stray field which we can't get rid of. So we're, we're trying to null out the field here by varying the applied field. We can make it as small as this, but no smaller. That's because we have a residual field of on the order of 50 to 80 millivolts per, per centimeter. So we have to be careful that we don't confuse this residual Stark signal with the E2 that we're looking at. This is at very high end. We're looking at the E2 signals at predominantly low end. So basically what we do is we make measurements like this at high end, and then we, we do this as a function of n, and the prediction is that the signal size of this D peak to the P adjacent P signal should scale like n to the tenth very rapidly. So if we fit to this n to the ten scaling and then extrapolate to low n, that tells us how much of the signal we see at the D resonance is due to Stark versus a real E2 transition. And it turns out that at n equals 59, which is the highest point where we make an E2 measurement, it's about a 50% correction due to this Stark contribution. So here, here are the data. This is plotted, uh, what we're plotting here is the ratio of oscillator strengths for this forbidden transition to the D states to the allowed transition to the uh, P states. And notice the scale here is uh, about five times 10 to the minus four, which means the D states are weaker by about a factor of 2,000. They both scale approximately like n to the minus three. So the ratio is basically constant as a function of n. 
uh, the theory that this was uh, calculated by Robin Cote and his students basically just involves looking at the matrix element of R squared for a quadrupole transition from the 5s to the nd state, whereas the E1, of course, is just the matrix element of, of R. <coughs> and the 5s wave function used here uh, was from this reference, uh, of which Hossein Sadikpour is one of the co-authors. And for the D oscillator strengths, this comes from uh, this, this paper. It's an experimental determination. So the theory is not so bad. It's off by a, a, bit, a bit of a scaling factor. But if you make that correction, uh, the agreement as far as the independence is pretty good. OK, so why is this ratio so quote unquote large? Well, it's not very large. It's 5, 10, 10 to the minus 4. But it's actually larger than you'd think it would be for a forbidden transition. This is for the high end states. If you look at low end, for example, the 4D state, the uh, ratio of oscillator strengths from 5s to 5p, which is, of course, basically unit, unit, unity uh, oscillator strength. This guy is about 10 to the minus 6. The reason we think it's so large is because, not because the f for the d states is so large, but it's because the f for the p states is small. It's reduced by a Cooper minimum just above threshold. So this is a, a, a plot from this old paper of the photoionization cross-section for rubidium. The threshold is right here. So as you go just above threshold, there's a strong Cooper minimum, which is suppressing the oscillator strength near threshold, or to the Rydberg states, by a pretty large factor. This is about a 10 to the minus 19 square centimeter cross-section. Normally, you'd expect at least 10 to the minus 18 for a typical photoionization. OK, so if I just plot the oscillator strength of the D states, you see that indeed it is pretty small. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 10. And it does scale pretty well, like uh, n to the minus 3. OK, uh, in the interest of time, let me just go through this real quick. Uh, we, while we were doing the spectroscopy, we also looked at the, the fine structure for the P states. So basically, we just look at the strength of the P1 half transition relative to the P3 halves transition. Statistically, based on just the degeneracies, you'd expect this to be a 2 to 1 ratio. Obviously, it's not. Uh, so if we plot that ratio, oscillator strengths to the 3 halves versus the 1 half, we get something between 4 and 5, pretty much constant over n, whereas this is the ratio of degeneracies of, of 2. And this is, again, to be understood in terms of this Cooper minimum, because the, the two uh, transitions, the two J transitions to 3 halves and 1 half, have slightly different Cooper minima. OK, we also did it for the D states. There, the data was consistent with the degeneracy ratio of about 1.5. So this is for the, uh, actually, that's a mistake. It should be the 5 halves to the 3 halves for the D states. OK, so one interesting thing, we're not really pursuing this. I'm just sort of throwing it out as a possibility, is uh, these E2 transitions to the ND states might be an interesting system for coherent control. Because you can go from 5s to ND by one photon, which is what I just talked about. Or you can go by two photons. That's just a normal two photon transition from s to d. And this light basically comes from the same laser. In fact, we we generate the 297 by frequency doubling this frequency. So you have two paths to the same final state, which obviously can give interference. And by varying the relative phase, might be able, one might be able to do some interesting coherent control. Normally, one does this with one photon and, and three photons by, for parity reasons. OK, so let me switch gears now and talk about the, uh, the second topic, which is uh, this 5p to 8p transition, which is E2, but also possibly an M1, a magnetic dipole transition. So the idea here is start in 5s, excite up to the 5p, and then drive this transition, 5p to 8p, which is not dipole allowed. And that's at 588 nanometers. We do this with a CW dye laser. <clears throat> so one of the motivations was, uh, it turns out there was a previous experiment from Mark Havey's group. And I won't go into the details, but basically it was a polarization experiment. So they, they looked at this, this two-step excitation, and they did this with parallel polarizations for the two steps versus perpendicular polarizations. And they could calculate a quantity like this. Uh, sorry, that should be I parallel minus I perp. 
over the sum. And from that, from their data, they could get a ratio of the strength of the M1 contribution to this, of this transition to the E2 contribution. And they got a very large ratio. They, they were of similar magnitude. Whereas the theory predicted that the M1 should be very, very weak, less than a part in a thousand. So this was a pretty serious discrepancy. So we wanted to see, you know, who was right, experiment versus, versus theory. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so we took a different approach. Instead of doing a polarization-based experiment, we took advantage of the selection rules, which we think is a very clean way to do this. So without going into detail, uh, this is the, the Hamiltonian for E2 transitions. It involves R squared. So when you do the matrix element of R squared between initial and final states, you find the following selection rules. This is for hyperfine levels. So delta F has to be 0, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2, with the caveat that the sum of the hyperfine levels has to be greater than or equal to 2. If you look at an M1 transition, the Hamiltonian is just the dipole, the magnetic dipole, mu. And if you take the matrix element of that, you get the following selection rules. The delta F has to be 0, plus or minus 1, with the caveat that the sum has to be greater than or equal to 1. And interestingly, magnetic dipoles actually have a delta N equals 0 selection rule as well, but that's only non-relativistically. So for a heavy atom like rubidium, of course, relativity plays an important role. So this is just a table. Uh, if we start out in the 5P3 halves, and go to the 8p1 half, these are the, the various hyperfine levels, and the, the, whether they can be driven by m1 or e2. And notice that the top row here, if we start in f prime equals 0, which is kind of a magic state, if you go to f double prime equals 1, that's only allowed by m1. If you go to f double prime equals 2, that's only allowed by e2. So the f, e, f prime equals 0 state allows a complete separation of these two types of transitions. So that's the trick we're going to, going to employ here. So again, just to show this schematically, here's the 5p3 halves level. If we go to this, start in this f prime equals 0 level, we can completely separate by just scanning over these two transitions. Looking at the relative signal sizes, we can determine the relative strengths of m1 versus e2. And this is in rubidium 87 because 85 doesn't have this f prime equals 0 state. Okay, so here's the excitation scheme. We start with the MOT, turn that off, use a depletion laser to populate the lower level here, F prime equals 1. Again, this is rubidium 87. And then our preparation step goes from 1 to 0. So we start in this magical F prime equals 0 state. And then we go up with our dye laser and scan over these two transitions to probe the M1 and E2 uh, transition strengths. And then we detect by photoionization with a pulsed, uh, pulsed laser and look at the ions. <clears throat> okay, now this F prime equals zero level is nice because the delta F selection rule says that it should decay only back to F equals one. However, you can optically pump into these sublevels like so. So if you, you start here, you do delta M equals zero going up, you can decay into these other levels from which you cannot go back up with delta m equals zero. So this looks like a problem in that you accumulate population in these inaccessible dark states. <clears throat> so the timing should be important. That is, you want to do this excitation and then do the next step before this optical pumping takes place. So this shows the timing. We turn off the MOT, we deplete, we do this preparation here, and we, the excitation laser is always on, the one driving the 5p to 8p. But then the detection has to come not too long after we do this preparation and excitation because of this optical pumping problem. And this shows that the F prime equals zero population should go up and then decay due to this optical pumping. And the excitation to AP is pretty slow and also very weak. This is uh, multiplied by a factor of 1,000. And so if we detect somewhere in here, we should see a pretty good AP signal. Now what about the ionization detection? Well, initially we thought 532 would be great. It turns out it's not so good because the cross-section is pretty low because we're way above threshold. This state is only bound by about 4,000 wave numbers. By the way, uh, I'm taking some liberties here and calling this a Rydberg state, right? This is a Rydberg meeting. <laughs> 
If you just look at the number itself, eight sounds great. If you realize the ground state is five, then it's not so impressive. But if you allow me, I'll continue to call it a Rydberg state. Uh, OK, so the 532 isn't so great for photoionizing. It also has the problem that a 5S atom can absorb two photons and photoionize. So that gives a pretty big background. So in fact, it's much better to use the fundamental of the YAG at 1064, which doesn't have the two photon problem and also has a bigger cross section. So that's what we did. Uh, also, regarding this optical pumping, it turns out it's really not a problem. And we can use CW preparation. Uh, this was from, coincidentally, Mark Havey's group as well. It turns out in the MOT that you have uh, radiation trapping or diffusive light scattering, and also Zeeman mixing because you have a magnetic field, an inhomogeneous field in the MOT, and that tends to screw up this dark state. So uh, we don't, didn't have to worry about this as, as much as we thought we would. Okay, so let me just show you the, uh, the spectra here. So this is starting in f prime equals 2. So this is not the magic f prime equals 0 state. <coughs> starting here, we have E2 transitions to both of the excited states, the f double prime equals 1 and 2. Uh, you can clearly see that here. Uh, so the solid curve is the data. The dashed lines are fits to, uh, to two Gaussians. So you see the fits are pretty good. It's an interesting question why the fits to Gaussians are so good, in fact. And also the line width here is not completely understood. Nonetheless, if we now go to our magic f equals zero, f prime equals zero state, then we see the transition, the strong E2 transition to f, prime, f double prime equals two. But the weak M1 transition to f double prime equals one should be here. And there's basically nothing. So if we blow that up, that's shown here. So this is blown up by basically a factor of 100. Uh, it's just noise. And we tried to fit a Gaussian to it, the dashed line. And of course, in an individual scan, you can always fit a Gaussian to it. This one actually doesn't look so bad. But we repeat this many, many times. And for each scan, we fit a Gaussian. And sometimes the Gaussian comes out positive, like this example. Sometimes it comes out negative. Sometimes it comes out zero. So that's consistent with there basically being nothing there. So what we do is look at the statistics of the height of this Gaussian and conclude that, on average, we get a very small number that's consistent with zero. So we get some average and some standard deviation, and the result is, is consistent with zero. So all we can do, really, is set an upper limit on the strength of the M1 transition that should be here. And so that's the, the results are shown here. So we're looking at the ratio of the uh, weak M1 transition to the strong E2, well, relatively strong. It's still a forbidden transition, but the ratio of those two. Uh, so this is our result. We can set a limit of slightly less than 1%. The previous result that I mentioned earlier has about a 40% uh, result, which is obviously inconsistent with ours. And the theory, this was calculated by Andre Derevyanko. Uh, so this is an atomic structure calculation. I think I know what these acronyms mean, but I certainly don't know how he did the calculation. I think this is Dirac hartree fock and SD stands for single doubles method. And it's uh, fully relativistic. So he predicts about 0.06%, which is a factor of 10 less than the limit that we set. So our result is certainly consistent with his. It would be nice if we could push our results down to actually test his calculation. From this, you can also extract the, uh, the size of the M1 matrix element, assuming you know the, the electric quadrupole matrix element, which he also calculated. And so again, the, the initial result gave a pretty big number there. Ours is much smaller, but still the limit we set is larger than the, the theoretical calculation. Uh, let me skip this in the interest of time. Uh, let me just say that uh, what we've done here by using these selection rules to separate the, uh, the E2 and M1 transitions could be applied to any other NP, N prime P transition in rubidium or other alkalis. Uh, any alkali with an F prime equals zero level, which a spin, nuclear spin three halves uh, species would have that. Uh, this technique could be applied to that. So for example, there are some isotopes of francium that have such a state, and that would be even more interesting because, of course, the, 
the M1 transition that we're looking for is relativistic, and so high Z it should be larger and therefore observable. We, we were just able to set a limit on it. It turns out there's another trick you could use with fine structure selection rules. So if you start in the P, 5P1 half instead of the 3 halves like we did, that if you go to the different fine structure levels, 8P1 half, 8P3 halves, the 1 half to 1 half is M1 only. The 1 half to 3 halves is E2 plus M1. So you don't get complete separation, but if the M1 is small, you have effectively a way to measure it because that's the only thing you would see on the 1 half to 1 half. And this is nice because you don't need hyperfine resolution. You could, in principle, do this uh, with the pulsed laser. Okay, so let me conclude. I've basically told you about two experiments, one where we looked at 5S to ND, E2, electric quadrupole transitions. The oscillator strengths agree pretty well with the theory. Uh, this does allow you to go to other states that you can't go to by uh, electric dipole transitions. And also, you have to account for this if you're doing spectroscopy, that, that these transitions can occur. Uh, we also looked at fine structure ratios. In the second part, I told you about this 5P to 8P transition, which is predominantly E2 with a very weak M1 contribution. Our results are consistent with the theory, and we seem to have resolved this previous discrepancy, that uh, the theoretical calculation gave a very small result, the previous experiment gave a large result, which doesn't seem to agree with what we see. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude and uh, gladly answer any questions. Time for questions. In the uh, S to D transitions, you talked about the residual field, but somehow it seems that you only compensate the, the, the field in, in one direction. Right. What about the possible field perpendicular to it? Or for instance, that's, 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 that's the minutes? problem. That's what we can't compensate. So we, we only have uh, two field plates, so we can compensate along that direction. But if there's a, a field component perpendicular to that, there's nothing we can do about it with, with this present setup. And so that, we think, is what gives this uncancelable Stark, Stark effect or contribution. It, it could also be that uh, if, if there's a field gradient across our sample, even in that direction we can cancel, we can't cancel it completely because all we can do is a, you know, cancel it in one location. So that's another possibility. Do you have some speculation what uh, went wrong with the Havy experiment? Uh, I don't want to speak too much about their experiment. You know, I wasn't involved with it. But it, it was an experiment at high density and was done with pulse lasers. They actually saw a very weird thing where their measured value, they, they did this at different densities. And they saw that things seemed to level out at high densities. And that's the result they quoted. You, you would think that you know, you'd be safer dealing with things at low densities. But I mean, they had some explanations for that. But that's how they did the experiment. So. Yeah. How much power have you got in the laser that's going up to the 8P state? Is that a dye laser? Yeah, it's a dye laser. It's uh, a few hundred milliwatts. I think the intensity is on the order of uh, 50, to, 50 to 100 watts per square centimeter. Of an EIT directly on that forbidden transition. Probably the oscillator strengths are not much weaker than some of the Rydberg transitions. Uh, it's pretty weak. Is it much weaker than like going up to 100 in the Rydberg state? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the oscillator strength offhand, but uh, we, we could we could look it up. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank again Phil and the rest of the morning speakers.